and professionals, entrepreneurs, dualpreneurs, husband yeah. and wife teams, yeah. to really teach them the foundation and the fundamentals of what achievement is all about. But all of the fundamentals we learned from basketball and what you learned in business and being an entrepreneur, you know, it applies to business. And so everything that we learned on the journey to being entrepreneurs and athletes, we put into our program called Peak Performance Huddle. And so that's what this huddle is all about for any professional, any small business owner, any small business leader. I'm gonna coach all of these 10 leaders to become champions. It's about you getting to the top of the food chain and becoming a champ. It's the very first episode. Hi, I'm Walter Bond, former NBA athlete, Hall of Fame motivational speaker, and business accelerator. And I'm Antoinette Bond. I'm a real basketball wife, a mom, I'm a business owner, and a business acceleration coach. And this podcast is for business leaders, entrepreneurs, or anyone who's trying to get to their next level and just needs more support in business. Welcome Welcome to to the the huddle. Well, welcome. Welcome. Oh my God, Walter. We have done it. We have finally launched. We're here. Um, welcome to the huddle. Oh my God, the huddle. Awesome. And we feel all official. We got like real like podcasting microphones and a podcast studio. And, you know, we've been doing so much training and development and motivation through the years. You know, this is our first attempt to really get to the online community and really let everyone online know what we do because if they don't come into a ballroom or one of our coaching sessions they have no idea so the huddle is for any high achiever whether you're a professional a small business owner business leader the huddle and let me say this and I'm gonna throw it back to you as a former athlete if you watch a game you know we huddle up all the time You know, even in practice, you huddle up. And so when you huddle up, it's about your strategy, your vision, your communicating, you're fixing things, you're tweaking. And my sports background has taught me how important it is to huddle up. So this podcast is about you as a professional, you as a small business owner leader, making sure that you come to huddle up with us so you're equipped to go out and achieve. That is well said, well defined. Okay, well, let's introduce ourselves because, I mean, right, they don't know us. I mean, we're just starting this new platform. Platform, this mode of delivering our messaging. Um, we've been in business for 22 years as a couple. This year will be our 23rd year 23rd. being business partners in this industry, which has been in the training and development space. I'm Antoinette Bond. Um, I started off in my professional career. Oh, well, let me go back even further. So I'm a girl from Miami, Florida. So I'm from the 305, 305 all day. And from Miami, I left Miami and I went to Washington, D.C., went to Howard University. Hey, hey, Howard. Um, And did some pretty cool things on my journey from really from birth all the way till my first job out of college was going to work for a company by the name of Dr. Pepper. Um, Do you remember that? If you're Dr. Pepper, you're a pepper, I'm a pepper, we're all a pepper too. So that was my first job out of college. And before I left college, thankfully, I was at a friend's party. And I was there just kind of with some other people. But in this moment, um, there was a guy in the corner. (laughs) And I didn't know about that guy at the time. But that guy, later on, I came to discover, noticed me. So from my vantage point, I leave D.C., I leave the party, graduate, go on to Dallas, Texas, That was my first home outside of college, Dallas, and I love Dallas, Texas. So I get to Dallas, and then I get a phone call from some friends who were like, hey, Antoinette, do you want to go to a free basketball game? And of course, I'm like, a free game? I'm free all day. And so um, they are friends from Chicago. They invited me, told me to call their friend who was going to give me some tickets to go to this free game. And thankfully, my girlfriend Dion, Dion's from Philadelphia, she lives in D.C., but thank goodness my girlfriend Dion was in town visiting because she was like, Tony, call, call, call. Because at the time, I would have not thought to like be following up and calling and initiating, but I made that phone call, and I'm going to leave it with you. I'm going to rest that I'm going to rest that starting point with you because I know you could take it and do even more with that. Well, what Antoinette didn't know at the time when I saw her at D.C. at a Howard University party, the moment I saw you, I was like, that's wife. 
I mean, Ooh, and sucky, um, sucky. you had a boyfriend at the time. So weak. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you didn't know me, so I can't blame you for that. But I saw you at a party, and I went to my friends, and I was immediately like, yo, who is that? And they started laughing. And I'm visiting, right? I'm on Howard University's campus from Chicago, south side. What? Got a little west side in me, but for the most part, south side of Chicago, University of Minnesota, Big Ten, what it do. Uh, but I'm visiting my Howard University buddies at a party, and there's beautiful women everywhere, to be honest. And I saw you. I was like, yo, who was that? And they started laughing, and I'm like, what's funny? A little awkward because I'm visiting. So they're with all their Howard buddies and I just know a few of my Chicago guys. Mm -hmm. And they were like, man, that's his woman. So your current boyfriend was standing right there and heard me kind of ask about you. And I was like, my fault, dude. <laughs> and I go back in the corner, you know, minding my own business. And I'm like, man, this is not my set. And what happened four months later, you want to talk about God. Now, we we are believers. Yeah. Uh, we read the Bible. We yep. try our best to execute the Bible. And I've been praying to God, you know, about my life because my college basketball career was a hot mess. Didn't start in college. Um, I was living your typical athlete life. Um, was not, you know, spiritual. I mean, I'm just doing what you do in college. At least I thought so. But my life was a wreck. And I started praying to the Lord, and I saw you, and I was like, oh, my God. So four months later, I'm trying out for the Dallas Mavericks. After not starting in college, mm -hmm. I had a chance to make an NBA team, which would, be, which, which would be a miracle. Yeah. And my buddies was like, man, remember the girl in D.C.? I was like, yeah, of course. Like, dude, she just took a, took a job in Dallas. And so my next question I is know. like, what's up with the boyfriend, <laughs> right? right? And they were kind of like, you know what? That was just a little college thing. Don't worry about it. And I was mm -hmm. like, all right, cool. So uh, they gave me your number and somehow I wrote it down wrong and I tried to I call know. you. And I'm in training camp though. So right. keep in mind, I'm working out twice a day. I'm exhausted. But I got a chance to make the team. So I'm dialed in. I am focused. I'm that shark. You know, they say sharks go into a trance. And so I'm trying to make the team. But obviously, I was like, yo, that's wife material. So luckily, you called me. And I was in the hotel. And I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, and we went to a movie. Can't remember what the movie was. Four months later, we're engaged. About a year later, we're married. Right? And so to me, the, the, the ultimate message for me was you are my rib. Mm -hmm. And when I saw you, I recognized you mm -hmm. as my wife. Yep. And I tell all married men, your wife is your original side chick. Yeah. Right? What do I mean yeah. by that? Yeah. And, and God took a man's rib and created woman. Right. So when I saw you, I recognized you as my wife mm -hmm. because you came from me. Right. And I know that God put you on this earth to be my wife and you are Aww. my original side chick. Aww, and and let me so tell you sweet. something. You're not supposed to be in front of me. You're not supposed to be behind me. You're su supposed to always be by my side. And a lot of men get confused by that and how to really relate to their wives. And sometimes wives get confused. You're not to be in front of your man, okay? You're not to be behind him. You're supposed to be right by his side. And so my side chick, we've been together 30 years. We've built an incredible business, have three beautiful children. Uh, we've been up and down. We've been through a lot. But you know what? You are my chick. Uh, you are my partner. And we built something special together. And we're not done. This podcast is an opportunity for us really to get online. You know, mm -hmm. we've been in the ballrooms for a long time. Yeah. And the ballroom is anywhere from 300 people to 25,000 people. Um, but getting online, we want to touch the world. Yeah. And the huddle is a chance for all of us to really get some good teaching, some good coaching, and some guidance. So f for once, everyone's going to get to know you. Yeah. Uh, who's my original coach? Oh, you guys don't know this. I haven't shared this story on stage. And so that comes from my entrepreneurial family. And I come from preachers and teachers. If you're in the Bond family, you're either a preacher or a teacher. But I'm so something. thankful that I married a woman who came from entrepreneurs. And so you put that together. You know, you got your chocolate and my peanut butter. Right. I got my <laughs> peanut butter and your chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but at any rate, together, I mean, we built something global. And we feel like we're just getting started. You know, we yeah. got to the top of the food chain in the keynote business. And we still do keynotes. We love doing keynotes. But now we're committed to getting online and really helping small business owners and professionals, entrepreneurs, dualpreneurs, husband yeah. and wife teams, yeah. to really teach them the foundation and the fundamentals of what achievement is all about. And let me say this, and I'm going to throw it back to my point guard. That's your nickname, point guard. You know, when you make it to the NBA, you understand what it means to be elite. 
But all of the fundamentals we learned from basketball and what you learned in business and being an entrepreneur, you know, it applies to business. And so everything that we learned on the journey to being entrepreneurs and athletes, we put into our program called Peak Performance Huddle. So anyone who wants to achieve more, we're for you. And so that's what this huddle is all about for any professional, any small business owner, any small business leader. I just text one of my business leaders. I did a keynote for just 10 people. And they run a business. Each one of them have like a billion dollar responsibility. And I'm going to coach all of these 10 leaders to become champions. You know, it's not about you winning anymore. It's about you getting to the top of the food chain and becoming a champ. So, hey, that's the backstory. We met in a very spiritual kind of way. I know it was God. And so now the huddle, the peak performance huddle is our attempt. We're launching. This is the very first episode. And our whole vision is to get online and really transform some winners into champions. You know, you made a great point. I want to hone in on this because you talked about the background, what your family background is in terms of preachers and teachers and mine being entrepreneurial. And when I grew up in Miami, I grew up to two, I was in a two parent family. And the beautiful thing about my family, it was all about taking advantage of opportunities. And that was the mindset of my family. I would say it was always take advantage of opportunities. And number two, you were always going to work hard. And I think about that growing up. I, ha- I came from a, my dad had his own business. And my mom would go to work. She worked at FPNL. But she would, we would come home and she, everybody would support the business. And so when you're talking about being your rib and being your side chick, I was groomed to kind of be a helpmate, <laughs> to be honest. I was groomed knowing that, you know what? When you get an opportunity, you find a partner. You want to find a partner who's doing something amazing that you can come alongside them and help amplify all their efforts. And I think about when I talk to young ladies today, one of the first things that you got to ask yourself, is this man really doing something? And is he doing something or building or working on something, having some vision or some dream that I can come support and amplify? If the answer is no, I would tell anybody, you better run. (laughs) Because a man's job really is to first get themselves together, and then they know what the wife really looks like. And so that's very important. I think about that as I go back to my family. Well, my dad actually stopped going to school in the seventh grade. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, when I think about what my dad and my parents could create with a seventh grade education for my dad, my mom did finish high school, but they left North Florida, came down to South Florida. They met each other in a cafeteria in Miami. Working at the cafeteria. Work, they were both working at the cafeteria in Miami, and this is back in the 1960s. And so we'll think about Miami. I mean, although people see Miami as an international sexy city now, Miami is the South, and it was a Southern city. Florida is very Southern, but they actually got their opportunity in real estate. Why and how they bought their first place as a couple. And so when I start thinking about people who want to do business and do business and think about how do I get started? How do I do it? What I love about what we've done, we've done it as a couple. I saw my parents do it as a couple, and they went from owning their first duplex in the 1960s to where now you fast forward to 2024. My God, I think he has about 150 units where that is kind of business that we have back in Miami. So when you start talking about being a business owner, and we're talking about recalibrating, we all got to remember, in order to recalibrate, we all start small. And no matter where you are, it's simply a point of reference But one thing about recalibrating, and which is one of our favorite words that we always talk about around here, in order to recalibrate, you got to first be uncomfortable. And I think when we talk about recalibrating, let's talk about being uncomfortable in a space and you knowing that, you know what, there's more for me out there. And it's time for me to shift, change, grow, do what I need to do so that I can get more of what I really want out of life. Because we find so many people get comfortable, but they know they are not where they need to be. I, I'm so excited about this podcast, The Huddle, because a lot of people know me, you know, because of the keynotes and the YouTube and the social media things that we do. But nobody knows you. 
You yeah. know, nobody really knows what is behind me in terms of our team. And so I'm excited about all of the ladies out here, all of the business leaders out here who might enjoy my messages and charisma and personality. But I want everybody to know this is my original coach. You know, when basketball ended, I had never had a job and we needed to make money. And Antoinette went out and got a job. You became, you know, I met you, you worked for Dr. Pepper. And when my basketball career, or when our basketball career was yeah, over. Yeah, because it was ours. Yeah, we, we needed, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and we needed some money. I mean, we needed some money fast because I didn't make the big money. And you went out and got a job um, as a pharmaceutical drug rep. And mm -hmm. the beauty of it, I speak for a lot of pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And they like the message that we deliver. But when they found out that my wife was a pharmaceutical drug rep, that's like the icing on the cake. Yeah. But it, it's become a no-brainer for a lot of medical device and pharmaceutical companies. And they're like, how do you know so much? Well, my wife came from that. And I remember making sure that the kids left you alone while you studied. Mm -hmm. Because when you were getting the job, if you don't pass the test, you couldn't get the job. And for me... It forced me to be your help. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, I'm yeah. sitting at home, clueless, didn't know what I wanted to do after basketball. I was lost. I needed to recalibrate. I didn't know what to do. And I was miserable because I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what my next... Um, um, vision was after that and I appreciate you stepped up and got a job got us some benefits help a brother out yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> some, those benefits we need we needed you and, yeah. and, and in the interim when we decided to launch uh, Walter Bond seminars you were coaching me yeah I knew nothing about business you know so I want to thank you for just being the support willing to step up you know, because you hear about athletes all the time. As soon as the money gets funny and the careers are over, a lot of those chicks leave. Oh, absolutely. A lot of those chicks are like, mm -mm, bugs money, and they're out fast. And so you stood by my side. You helped me transition, and you coached me and then got me a coach, you mm -hmm. know, which was brilliant. And we were able to transition out of sports and build a crazy successful training and development company. But we had to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. And that word is so powerful. And I want everyone to hear us. Recalibration needs to be a part of your conversation. Yeah. It needs to be a part of your language. So right now, you might be frustrated. Right now, you might be stale. You might be like at a, it's a crossroad. You don't know what to do. Recalibrate. That is the word. And what does that mean? Trick, you know, tweak your approach. Do something different. Um, approach it differently. Don't keep doing everything the same way. And let's talk about this real quick. And I want your feedback on this. Because what we do from a training and development standpoint, we literally turn winners into champions. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give you examples of all of the individuals and companies that we've helped go from being winners into champions. And it's a journey, it's a process, but there's a difference between being a winner and a champion. Let me teach you something very powerful. <laughs> a winner is kind of committed to their way. This is how we've always done it. You know, this is just who we are. Well, okay. You've been doing this for 10 years, but it's not getting you the ultimate result. So winners are committed to their way, their system, their processes. Champions are a little bit different. Champions want results. And so the difference between a winner and a champion, a winner is committed to their way, their systems, their processes. A champion is committed to the result. So when we get our hands on an individual, when we get our hands on a company, we get them to set some goals and get them focused on their result and not their strategy that they've been doing that gets them victories but doesn't get them to be elite in their industry. Yeah. Let's talk about that because as a team, we were able to build a business from scratch yeah. and basically build a Hall of Fame business, from your lens behind the scene, what were some of the keys to us growing a business from scratch? Well, I would say, one, I'm going to bring back in the word recalibrate. And the why I think that, that's why I really want to make sure we get that across today, that recalibration mindset, because the mindset of recalibration is the same mindset is going to help you be successful in life, in business, at home. I think when you get committed in your mind that it's okay for me to shift, change, and recalibrate, then you start thinking and you open your mind up to the opportunities. And so when we launched our business, all I could do on do was draw my past. Right. And so when I think about the word recalibrating, and as you're just asking about what was the mindset when we launched our business, it was all about kind of drawing from my past, thinking about what I already had done, and using it in our future, in our present. And so when I think about when we launched, some of the cool things I'd already done in my life was, okay, yeah, I just worked for Dr. Pepper. 
I came out of a sales background. So I knew how to go connect with people. I knew how to go talk with people. I, before I even got to Dr. Pepper, I was a retail salesperson. I will never forget my first, one of my first jobs, I worked at Aventura Mall when Aventura first opened in Miami. I was working as a sales rep in a candy store. Then I fast forward to college, I work in a retail store in Georgetown. I'm working at this, oh, this amazing store back then called Episode, where we had amazing clothing, because I've always been into fashion and style. I mean, I was shopping at Bell Beauty Harbor. And the beast. Right, I was shopping at Bell Harbor back. I'll never forget my parents used to be like, oh my God, this girl is at Bell Harbor. You can't afford Bell Harbor. That's what they used to tell me back when I was in high school and I was like yes I can and I do whatever I needed to do to be able to go shop at Bell Harbor when I was in high school but anyway but so my background was already in sales so that selling background I had so I could check that off now in high school I was senior class president. I was our sophomore class president. I was, you know, remember back in the day you had superlatives, like best dress, best this. I was a lot of those superlatives. So I already had a past history that was all about connecting and leading. And so in order to, when I knew that connecting and leading was a part of my history, when we left the world of basketball, it was basically that moment for me to say, like, okay, let me go use what I had. And so that's one thing I would say was exciting because when you play basketball, all I could do is be a spectator. All I could do is sit back and be like, yay, walk, go, Walter. And, you know, I was a cheerleader. And the cool thing in high school is a cheerleader, too. So I know how to be a cheerleader. I could do cheerleading really, really well. That's what I did growing up. I was a cheerleader. But – Leaving sports and leaving a place where you were the dominant, it was almost like you were performing, you were on. Once we left sports, it was like, oh, wow, this, I finally can shine. And so, and all my gifts really start, really got to get amplified and come into play. And so that's why I would say, like, you know what? It's important, one, to realize what's already in your bag, what you already got as a person, because a lot of times in order to get to that next level of success for anyone, you already probably have the foundation of those tools already in your toolkit. Mm. And so a lot of times people that's are good. trying to go find this something new. That's good. No, start pulling on your reserve. Mm -hmm. Your reserve really already have enough success in it or biblical. some nugget in it that you can pull from. And I always talk about amplifying yourself, amplifying what you need to do, what you want to do, amplify what you have already done. And so when we started, that's really who I was. And so when I was doing my pharmaceutical sales gig and then you said to me, oh, OK, I think I know what I want to do now. And the cool thing, because before you said that, you were like, you were all over the place. I mean, he was talking about this, talking about that, talking about all kind of stuff. And I would say one of the best things, honestly, my, my dad has ever said to me, my dad has always said, in life, you do one thing. And I pulled that from my reserve and remember my dad said it. And he said that to me because we had that franchise business. We tried to do be franchisees of a play system while you still was playing basketball. And so I'll never forget when he, we wanted to invest in that business, his advice to me at that moment, his counsel was, no, Walter's a basketball player. You need to stay in the world of basketball. Don't try to do two things. He's like, people that try to do two things, they normally don't succeed at it. So he's always been telling me about cl having clarity and focus and making sure you have your one thing that you dominate that you're great at so that you can then, that's how you feed your family. And so when we started this, I was selling for doctor, I was selling, doing my pharmaceutical sales, but I would pull over. Remember back in the day, there was Kinko's? And I would pull over and, and go to phones, Kinko's. And and pay, I, was, I was working at Kinko's, pay phone, being in the parking lot, and just knew to get on the phone and start selling. And we know a fundamental in business is nothing happens in business until something is That's sold. Right. That's right. If you are not selling every day in your business, you're not creating opportunity. So you can't have a business just be talking about it. You got to have who is out front selling, and they got to be selling every single day. And so when we launched, that was it. We launched this business focused on we're selling. Selling is promoting, getting the brand out there. I was on Team Walter, so it was like, okay, how can I help Walter be successful? And so I think that was another thing that was probably advantageous. I wasn't competing with you. I complete you. So I've never needed to compete with you. I've always just needed to complete you. 
Well, you know, I, I love I love the message, and you know, right now, you know, any small business that's listening, the most important thing you can do is get your sales strong because mm-hmm. the sales is like an engine in the car. Yeah, you know, if any expensive car has a strong engine, the weaker the engine, the cheaper the car. So, if you want to grow a small business into something amazing. Typically, the first thing you have to really energize and fix is your sales team. And that's why we have clients right now, you know, going with the shark mindset because the shark mindset is a great way to energize your sales force because who wouldn't want a team full of ferocious sales reps who are relentless, who are consistent, who are aggressive, just attacking the marketplace because nothing happens in business until something is sold. But let's talk recalibration. Because that's the word of the day. Yeah. And if you don't get anything else out of this episode, our very first episode, we want everyone to understand how it is important, mission critical to recalibrate, yeah. right? And let me talk about my first recalibration. Mm. And I thought about this before we kind of coined the phrase and made it a big part of our coaching and consulting. We were recalibrating without even realizing it, mm. right? So I left my first high school. I, yeah. Okay, all right, I'm being nice. I flunked out my first high school. My parents sent me to one of the top high schools in Chicago, Whitney Young. These are the smartest kids in Chicago, and I failed. I flunked out, 2.1, 2.2. My dad was a high school principal in the hood on the west side, and people thought I transferred because he had a great basketball team. Part of it, the real reason I transferred is because I had like a 2.1 at Whitney Young. A 2.1? So, 2.2. Maybe 2.3. Oh, okay. hun, hun, honey. <laughs> oh, these, honey. The, the, these were the smartest kids in Chicago. And the first recalibration was basically my parents saying, like, look, dude, this ain't working. We got to change. We have to shift. We have to pivot. And if you know the shark mindset, sharks are made of cartilage, which means they know when to pivot. They know when to change. They know when to shift. That was the first recalibration. It helped me academically, and it helped me athletically. And so when something's not working, recalibrate. Right. The end goal for my family, my parents wanted me to go to college and graduate. I wanted to play in the NBA. So we both understood that, listen, Whitney Young is not working. We need to recalibrate. You know, I think about the second time I recalibrate. And that worked. Okay, it worked. Because you left. You left that school. Went to another school. Yep, I transferred to my dad's high school. So now I'm the principal's son. It worked. My GPA got higher. And then I got, you know, recruited. was getting into college. And then I got into college on a basketball scholarship. And before that, neither one was, like, looking strong. I wasn't being recruited. And my grades were horrible, right? So that one calibration worked and it have supplied happiness for my mom and dad academically yeah. and for me athletically but how about this one a couple of years later i'm at the university of minnesota sitting on the bench right and my dream was to play in the NBA, yeah. all right? My parents were like, you're in college. So I'm like, okay, we need to recalibrate. Yeah. So my dad called me one day and he said, son, you don't play, why not? Yeah. And I said, Dad, politics, it's political. I had all these excuses. Yeah. Just like I had when I was flunking on my first high school. Yeah. You know, when you underachieve, you justify it. You make excuses, right? right? My dad asked me a simple question, how did your coach get paid? And I was like, well, I guess he gets paid to win. He says, okay, son, if your coach gets paid to win, won't he play the players to give him the best chance to win? The good news is, even though my dad was all about academics, he's a former ball player himself, right? Yeah, right. And he was like, look, if you can help that man win, you'll play. Right, right. Okay, right. all right. So I got to do something different. Well, you know, it was amazing what your dad did for you in that moment. He took away all the excuses. Yep, made me accountable. And so, Absolutely. honestly, that's that's the cool thing because we all need people in our lives that can just put that conversation on the table. And you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that is all about not making excuses. And okay. you had that in your life. And we need people like that in our lives. So carry on. What yeah. happened yeah. was that because of that conversation, I set up a meeting with my coach. And I basically went in and asked him a simple question. What do I need to do to play in the NBA? Right. right? Because that's the result. Right. Right. The result was a play in the NBA. So after that conversation, all I did was ask my coach, what do I need to do to play in the NBA? And he was like, son, you can't run, you can't jump, you can't dribble, you can't shoot, you can't rebound. And I was like, I know I got weaknesses, coach. But what he didn't know was my past. Right. I turned a 2.1 into a 2.9, almost 3.0. So I had some history, right? And I was like, okay, I get where I am now. Yes. But the end result is the NBA. Yes. That's what I'm focused on. I don't care how it looks. I want my faith and not by sight. Absolutely. Come on. So the vision vision was the result of playing in the NBA. And I knew that you can transform any situation if you're accountable. Yeah. And my dad kind of reminded me of that, right? And so I began to move different as a student. And I began to move different as an athlete. And my coach was like, you can't run. You can't jump. You can't dribble. You can't shoot. You can't rebound. I said, coach, next year I'll be your most improved player. And in the off season, 
I worked harder. In the off season, I was honest with myself. What I what am I weak at? What do I need to improve? And for five months, I came back bigger, stronger, and faster. And by my sophomore year, I was considered the top six men in the country. And our team began to win. Wow. So it wasn't just about wow. me. I helped our team win. Yeah. And for you basketball fans, Dick Vitale loved me. You know, Walter Bond's a PT peer. He's a PT peer. But it really cemented that you're in control of your life. Right, right, right. You know, by the time I was like 20, I completely understood. I'm in complete control of my life. I found that out academically. I found that out athletically. And because of that conversation, I ended up making it to the NBA, starting for the Dallas Mavericks. And so when basketball was over, I understood the power of recalibration. Mm -hmm. If you're not where you want to be, recalibrate. Okay? And I I kept the end result in mind. You know, and a lot of people don't do that. You know, a lot of people have these small little goals or they get distraction, distracted or they settle. Right. And, and one thing I'm, I'm thankful to have an infrastructure around me. My parents wouldn't let me settle. And you sure as hell. Because <laughs> this girl still likes to shop. At the <laughs> I'm like, come on, puppy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come she on, still, baby. She still likes to shop and live in nice houses and buy nice <laughs> stuff. And I love that about you. Uh, because it forces me to keep recalibrating. And so recalibration is the word. And w- w- we came up with recalibration because of our business needs. But we were the first ones to recalibrate in our own personal lives. Yeah. And so we know the process. You yeah. know, a lot of times you have to understand something's not working. Yeah. You have to understand when you're off track. You need to be honest and say, look, this is not going the way I thought it should go. Yeah. And so all of our clients, that's kind of like the first thing we ask them. Like, what's your audacious goal and they look at us like huh like if you don't have an audacious goal you're never going to be a champion yeah yeah yeah. right and so recalibration allows you to stay on track to achieve this audacious goal and we're just so thankful for our clients will call us in tears will email us and how thankful they are yeah and all we're doing is kind of teaching them what we understand biblically yep right i I will bless you as far as your eyes can see come on that's a that's a that's biblical without a vision the people Perish. Perish. So right. to me, the, the big audacious goal is your vision of where you want to be. So, you know, recalibration, everybody listening at home. This is our first episode. I think it's going pretty good. I don't know about you. I feel good about it. <laughs> but recalibration is necessary. Yeah. It's foundational. It's fundamental to any individual or any business leader or, or entrepreneur or solopreneur, whatever your label is, if you're not living your best life right yeah. now, if you're not on target for your best life, the huddle is for you because we're going to drop content. We're going to drop information. We're going to tell you our real story. We're not going to sugarcoat anything. We have filed bankruptcy before, okay? We've been on top. We've been on bottom. We've been everywhere in between. But we understand the journey to becoming a champion. Let me tell you something, man. It is so important to learn from your setbacks, right? And as my guy Willie Jolly would say, your setback is a setup for your comeback. And recalibration. Tell us about your most important recalibration recalibration you know in your life that really kind of cemented why recalibration is so important to us oh I would say I probably have a good th- I really have a good three honestly my I love the my, one that you tell me about when you first stepped foot on Howard's campus actually I'm gonna go even further back than that oh, wow. because I grew up in my remember I grew oh, up in yes. Miami yeah so I grew up going to our Cola Lake Elementary School which yeah. was in the city yeah, and the way. so that was like, it was, you know, I, I grew up right in Liberty City. I was right there near Liberty City, right there, right there. Eating and so I went to, and... oh, eating <laughs> hot sausages. I took hot sausages <laughs> to my friends when I went to Howard. They still be like, oh my God, what is this girl eating? Now but anyway, latest. so my first major recalibration was coming from our Cola Lake. And my parents, at this moment, I was a patrol girl. I was like the girl like leading. I did a lot of leadership activities. And I was a girl that um, the principal, I was on everybody's list. Basically, you know, there was always the girl, the the boy that you're like, the teacher's pet. I was a teacher's pet. And so that was my elementary experience. And then I remember when it was time to go to junior high school, my parents were like, you know, you're smart. You have a lot going on for you. And that was already seated in my mind. So actually, as I listened to you talk about, oh, being at that Whitney Young and feeling like all the kids were smarter than you, I grew up totally different because I grew up being like, oh, I was the smartest. I was the smartest. I felt like I was cute. I was popular. I was outgoing. 
Yeah, I was yeah, that. Yeah, I was headstrong. I, I, was headstrong. All, I was all that. And so that's why, I mean, honestly, I've been thinking about what my counsel is to parents when they're t- trying to make a decision on where to put their kids for elementary school. I'm like, you know what? The most important thing you could do for your children is get them confidence. Yeah, and that true. confidence, you really gain that in your foundational years. So between birth and almost like sixth grade, that is when your confidence gets built. That's when it gets locked in. That's when it gets secured. So my parents took me from this inner city environment, and then I went over to a suburban school. At the time, it was North Miami. Back in the 80s, North Miami is more like suburbia. It was very diverse. And I got there, and I'm going to tell you, when I showed up, I showed up splitting my verbs. My verbs were getting split. I mean, I was talking. I was a girl from the inner city. And so I'll never Ebonics? forget. Is that it was I was like kind of Ebonic-y. Okay. It really was, right. to be for real. I never heard that but term, splitting it's, verbs. You know, but it was. I was um, doing little things that were you not were proper. I you wasn't spoke pro- the way your culture it's, spoke. Exactly. I wasn't yeah. speaking proper English. And that was one of the first things when I got to elementary. I got some friends immediately. And they would laugh at how I talked. And then I remember I used to feel very insecure about it. I was saying, roll up the windows. So I was kind of country too. So I was saying, roll up the windows, crank up the car. And like, so doing all this stuff and even saying things in a way that had people laughing at me. So they would laugh at me. With you or at Oh, laugh at me. I was getting laughed at. Oh, wow. And so I was getting laughed at. And I actually, and then I'll never forget. Remember, that was back when Izod's and Polo's came on the scene. And my mom would take me to Sears. And all I could get was the Bragging Dragons. Remember the dragon at Sears? I remember Sears? the tiger. I remember a tiger. Oh, my God. Sears had Bragging Dragons. And I would never forget all the little kids at my preppy school because my school was kind of preppy. My school was preppy. North yeah. Miami at this time, yeah, yeah. it was very suburban, very preppy. And so I got there. I'm wearing these dragons that everybody knows. If you wore a dragon, you knew you were shopping at Sears. There was no confusion. So, you know, with a polo or Izod, you don't know where you're shopping. But I was wearing these bragging dragons. And then I'll never forget feeling sad. I know what I was sad. And then mind you, back then, people used to call me go ahead forehead. So I mean, I think about today when people talk about being bullied. Oh, my God. I would have been in circa 2024. What was happening to me then would have been called bullying. So all that was happening to me, and I'll never forget a pivotal day in my life when I got to elementary, when I was at the seventh grade, I was listening to one of the fellow students. He was of another culture. And I'll never forget, he split a verb. The moment I heard him split split that verb, that's when I had that epiphany that, you know what? I was like, oh, wait, they're no better than I am. And I will say that was my first moment of realizing that, wait a minute, no matter where we're from, everybody got something. Everybody split verbs. Everybody split. Nobody's always speaking proper English. And so everybody got something. So that was my first moment of really needing to recalibrate. And my recalibration came when he split that verb. I said, oh, yeah. Okay, now I know how to go compete. And that moment I started competing, and that's when I started winning class presidents. I was like journalist. I did. I started winning. And then another thing happened, even that same person that split that verb, he had just beat me for like eighth, like seventh grade president. So I ran, but I lost to this boy. And I'll never forget when he split that verb, I was like, oh, here we go. I'm about to go get you. And I I kid you not. That's when I that's when my mind shifted. So that was my first recalibration. Then I got to high school, had to recalibrate again because I was like, okay, I won in middle school. How I go win in high school? Right. Had to recalibrate. New level. New level. And I won there. Got to Howard. Ooh, now this was a big recalibration because mind you, coming from Miami and I was already the girl who was winning. I got to Howard and everybody else there was a senior class president or student class president. Or they were and pretty they and were cute. like they were beautiful i'm not got to howard those chicks were beautiful i saw girls and i was like oh my gosh she's gorgeous so when i thought i was a cute little girl i was like oh no she's gorgeous and so my freshman year i saw i saw them then but i saw you but i mean you know i always say like oh my god they're gorgeous some of the most gorgeous beautiful women i saw was at howard at the time and very attractive young men too so you got there and i remember we used to call it it was the beautiful people (laughs) what it was all the beautiful Uh, people yeah exactly (laughs) But 
I'm gonna tell you, my first sem- my first year at Howard, my grades were terrible. I did not even want to go to class. Right. I remember me and my girlfriend, Sabrina, we would lay up in the dorm in Truth Hall. We would lay there, watch our soap operas, and not even go to class. And then I remember the grades came in the, after the first semester, and I was like, okay, this is not how this is going to go down. Right. And so then what had to happen? I had to recalibrate. Right. And another, So I think as I tell my story and as you tell your story, we all have a story about when we had to recalibrate, how we recalibrate, and the benefits of recalibrating. And so honestly, that's, I think, For today, I feel like that's a great foundation. And I think leaving you all on this note of, you know what, recalibrating in your life, it matters. And you can't be afraid to do it. You got to embrace it. And I think the cool thing is when you just call it, oh, it's time to recalibrate, it's fun. It's like you almost have this term that you know it's like it's huddle up, as you just said. It's huddle up time. It's game on time. Because what? We about to do something different. And that's why we're here today. Right. And you, if you really think about it, again, I'm a sports guy. And so that's kind of like my lens first. And I've become a business guy and a business coach. But let's think about the Super Bowl, right? Mm. The San Francisco 49ers were out playing Kansas City. But at the Super Bowl party we went to with all these smart business guys, I said, yeah. you just wait. You just wait. Andy Reid is going to recalibrate at halftime. Right. And make some adjustments and tweak at halftime. And I had full confidence that Kansas City was going to win the championship and win the Super Bowl because the leader to me is the best game manager there is who will recalibrate in the moment yeah. to win the championship. San Fran came out great. You can almost see their plays were scripted. They were ready for the Super Bowl. But after they got through all their scripted plays and just had to play football and be in the moment, Kansas City slowly began to pull away, and it took them to the overtime to win it. But my whole message is Kansas City is the champ because they recalibrated. Mm -hmm. They didn't play well the first few quarters, but they recalibrated. And the key for us to get a victory is that we have to have a guide to help us through the recalibration. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've learned through sports. And I want to make a bold Mm -hmm. statement. And on my way to the NBA, it was nothing more than research. That research that I undertook to become (laughs) elite – is transformational, right? And the truth is, if you want to be elite, it is impossible. Y'all hear me clearly. I don't care if you're an individual, small business owner, solopreneur. It is impossible to reach your potential without a guide, an advisor, or a coach. The best part about my pro basketball career is that by the time I was 32 years old and I retired, I understood that you had to have a coach. Every great player is connected to a great coach. And so if you have to recalibrate your sales, if you have to recalibrate your culture, if you have to re- recalibrate your goals, it is so important if you understand that the huddle we are here to help you guide to help guide you through your recalibration so that you can get to your ultimate result and that's the key of the huddle we want to build champions but in order to be a champion you must be willing to recalibrate Mm, you said that's so good, honey. Thank you. Let me say it again. Got me all excited. Okay, Ooh. you're trying to holler at me. Okay. Mm, always, honey. Always. <laughs> Hit me with some of that Liberty right. City violence. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Uh, I'll understand. <laughs> Split that verb. Uh, I don't care. You're so silly. <laughs> All right. South so, side. Um, I think for a first episode, I think we did pretty darn good. We're talking about recalibrating. And one of our free books that we give out is called Next, How to Recalibrate and Shift to Win. We love for you to get a copy. I think it's a great foundation. It even tells you some of our story. But we actually start talking about how you can do that in your own life. And that's what we actually coach to all the time. Everything we teach, everything we coach is always about how do we shift, change, advance, and continue to grow. And I'm excited that we're always on a growth turn journey. And, you know, sometimes I look at you when we're doing something. I'm like, you know what? I'm so blessed that I get to do life with you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And so if you want to get our copy of Recalibrate, make sure you click the link below. We love to have you get your free copy and share it. And, you know, I just told I was like somebody just wrote the other day and say they read it in one sitting. It's a quick, easy read, but it's some good nuggets to really apply to your life. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this first edition of The Huddle. Um, I think we did it, baby. We did it. We launched. And launching a lot of times is the toughest thing to do. And I'm excited that we'll be back for episode two and then episode 200. 
Um, so from Antoinette, I'm signing out. What you got, Walter? Well, I want to say this, and I, I want to do it right. Comment, comment, like, like, and, share. and subscribe. Oh, subscribe. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we need to we need to do four things. Oh, we're gonna get smooth. Okay. With it, comment, you know. like, Pretty soon, share, we're gonna be just subscribe. Real. Yeah, we sloppy yes. right now. But comment, comment like, like, share, share subscribe. subscribe. And, and my thought is, as I close, we're recalibrating right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this podcast is our recalibration because we've been in that ballroom for 23 years and we love it. I mean, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I love keynote speaking, but for us, that's really like the commercial for what we really do. Yeah. And now we're coaching small businesses and individuals. We coach speakers and the whole goal is to get you to your championship. And yeah. we have a whole curriculum. We have a bunch of content that is really a roadmap to becoming elite. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be elite, uh, we turn winners into champions. Now, yeah. if you're comfortable, you're not ready yet. You know, if you if you're like kind of stubborn and stuck, and and you, you you're just not ready yet. But if you're a person or or a small business leader, small business owner, and you believe you're meant for more, you have this audacious goal, you have some incredible result. Um, that's who we're for because a lot of times I've been stuck. Right, and I needed a guy um, in business and life and sports as an author. It took us a long time to get a book deal. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> we couldn't get a book deal. And then we met Mark Victor Hansen uh, from Chicken Soup for Your Soul. Yeah. And he guided us to a book deal. And our, basically, our first publisher, Wiley, we wrote the book Swim, and yeah. they loved the, the results of Swim in a shark mindset. This thing has become a thing, you know, the shark yeah. mindset. Everybody's seen our YouTube video, over 4 million views went viral. They committed to our our next three books so think about that we couldn't get a book deal we met an advisor coach guide whatever words you want to use mark victor hansen now all of a sudden we're the star publishers of of um of wiley wants to do the, our next three books so yeah. uh my, my message as a former athlete now a hall of fame motivational speaker my whole life been been, been about being coached by my parents, being coached by my wife, uh, being coached by Mark Victor Hansen, being coached by business coaches. I just lost 40 pounds. Why? Well, I have a personal trainer yep. who's my coach. That's and every right. morning at 7 a.m., Mac, move with Mac, coaches me hard. Sometimes I love him. Sometimes I hate him. Yep. And I hate leg day. Leg day sucks. But under his leadership, I've lost 40 pounds. And so I'm getting the result that I want. So my final parting message, to become a champion, you have to be connected to some kind of guide, some kind of advisor, some type of coach. And I talk about Andy Reid, Phil Jackson, Bill Belichick, who, eh, you know, Tom Brady. We'll see. Talk about that later. But you have to have some kind of guide. And the huddle is a chance for you to come and get some guidance on what you need to do to get your best result and live your best life without settling for anything less than your best life. All right. There we go. There we go, babe. Signing off. All right. Subscribe. Thanks for joining like. us. Share, comment, subscribe, like, like share, share, comment, comment subscribe, subscribe, like, share, share comment. comment, and see you in episode right. two.